All right. Hey. Oh, shucks. Good morning. I'm glad that. <laughs> hey. Good morning. I'm so glad that you're here as we kick off this new series on on what it means to be happy. Today we're going to dive into a series on the Beatitudes. You know, I'm discovering more and more these days. It seems it's hard to find someone who's genuinely happy. And yet the Lord's given us this great salvation that brings joy into our lives and purpose. You know, I, I think it's this. So many of us have come to believe that happiness is actually found in pursuing happiness. Jesus says that it's actually found in pursuing something else. And I would say that it's ultimately found in pursuing Him. We're looking into this new series on the Beatitudes. And today, David Huey, who's our minister to families, is going to kick it off. And there's nobody better than David to talk about this in, in relation to our families, how we uh, apply this message in our relationships. And so I'm so excited uh, for you to welcome David Huey as he begins this incredible series on what it is to be happy. So I'm glad you're here. Let's get happy. Glad that you guys are here. We are starting off a new series uh, called Happy, and of course, our pastor can juggle. Why could he not? So I thought the best thing to do is really try to upstage him. Uh, it, no, actually, I can't do that, but I just wanted to at least point out, uh, just to kind of remind you about our series, we will have after the service these little stress balls, because we know that we're starting school, I many of us are kind of going back to that, and that makes some of us a little worried, some of us have jobs that we just need to squeeze these things a little bit, and so we've got these for you to kind of remind you about our series. I thought I would give a couple away. So kiddos, you don't get these until the end of service. But I saw Tristan over here. Tristan's a good athlete. So there you go, Tristan. You can have that. I also saw uh, Maddie Roach back here. Uh, Maddie was the most fun person to watch in worship today. I'm going to see you up on stage uh, someday. So you are doing awesome. I just love seeing you. So there you go, Maddie. And... Uh, I don't know if we've got someone over here. I see Keith Beasley, but I'm just going to hum one at you guys somewhere over there. So uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, this series that we're getting kicked off uh, on the Beatitudes. Uh, it, it is about happiness, but I thought the way that we could really understand what this series is all about is actually start kind of on a sad note. I'm going to talk about someone uh, that's in our country that is divisive. He causes chaos. You know him. He's a public figure. And over the years, you've seen families get really divided on whether or not they like him or not. He's a person in our country who kids have different opinions than mom and dad when it comes to this man. He's owned businesses. He's lost businesses. He's owned hotels. And yet people in this country seem to be very divided on whether or not they should follow this man because he teaches us that if you gain more, if you ex get access, if, if you take over and have power, that it'll make you happy. And of course, I'm talking about this man right here. <laughs> Who'd you think I was talking about? <laughs> See, it's interesting because the, the Monopoly man, I don't even know if he's got a real name, but he, he does. He has taught us since we were small that if you accumulate, if you take everything from everyone, if you build the hotels and you dominate the world, it will make you happy. I've actually learned a lot from this man. Even in the summer between my 11th and 12th grade year in high school, me and some buddies would stay up about two or three nights a week, all night long, playing Monopoly, eating ramen noodles, and we called ourselves the Dead Monopoly Society. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, you knew how to party, David, I tell you what. Uh, you're, you're right. So, but Monopoly teaches us that if you gain all or if you, if you have everything, that it will make you happy. And the truth is, as we know, that's not true. So what makes us happy? Well, to start off the, the series on the Beatitudes, it's really the very beginning of a famous sermon uh, that Jesus teaches called the Sermon on the Mount. It's maybe the most studied passage in all of Scripture. You, you actually see multiple people worldwide look at this particular sermon as something to be revered. Christians and non-Christians alike actually hold respect to this. Even Gandhi, 
held that the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes especially were something to live by. They were universally good. And so they were the most studied uh, portion, maybe in all of Scripture. And there's really a couple of different ways that people look at what the Scripture is all about. The Sermon on the Mount. There's about eight or ten different views of why Jesus taught this sermon. We're not going to get into that today, but maybe there are two things that I wanted to point out. First is there's this idea, uh, you see this all throughout Scripture, that there's a now and not yet principle. You may not have heard this before, but this is found all throughout Scripture. The idea here is that when you are studying this particular passage, that you can gain knowledge, you can gain happiness, you can gain wisdom now, the here and now, but you'll never fully experience that until Christ comes and sets up his perfect kingdom on the earth. So he's teaching, you know, first century Christians, he's teaching them that you can experience a good life or a happy life or a blessed life now, but we all know because of sin in the world, we're never going to fully experience that until Christ comes back. So there's the first principle I, I agree with. The second principle is a principle that kind of Martin Luther held to, and it's one that I also hold to, and that was, is that the Sermon on the Mount paralleled to the, the Ten Commandments and the law, the previous law, and that Jesus came and he said, I'm not creating and giving you a brand new law. I'm the fulfillment of this law. And Paul in Romans would say that the law is like a mirror. That when I look in a mirror, no matter what I want to say, I can see the imperfections. I can see the, the, you know, the 40-year-old belly or whatever it is that I see in the mirror. We can't argue with that. And Paul would say that the law is like a mirror, that when we look into it, we see our imperfections, and it, we realize that we can't meet up to those standards. And so those standards would then drive us through frustration to have full dependence on God. Jesus comes and takes the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, not only is this a, not a new law, I'm the fulfillment, and then he makes it more difficult. For example, he takes one of the Ten Commandments. He says, you've heard that it said, thou shall not murder. But Jesus takes us a step further. He says, but I say to you, if you hold hatred in your heart, if you get angry in your heart, you've committed, uh, committed murder in your heart. I'm guilty of that. The Ten Commandments say, do not commit adultery. But Jesus said, if you have lust in your heart, then you've committed adultery into your heart. I'm guilty. And Jesus is, is taking the Sermon on the Mount with very difficult and hard teachings, not in order to, to make us depressed, but in order for us to go, we can't amount to the standard. And so we've got to be pushed back to someone who can bring us happiness. Before he teaches all of his hard teachings, he starts with these, what we're going to be talking about for the next six weeks is the Beatitudes, the attitudes to become. And they're on happiness, they're on bl the blessed life, the good life. And he wants, like most good preachers, he wants to kind of meet the people where they are. Before he, he asks any demands or any hardships or hard teachings, he wants to teach them uh, blessing. And this is where we pick up in the Beatitudes. It's a set of Proverbs. And we're going to be looking at Matthew 5, verse 3 today. Blessed or blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me read it again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think it's important for us to understand when, we, when we're looking at this particular passage, what does this word blessed mean? I'm not a Greek scholar, and so if any of you are a Greek scholar, when I'm about to pronounce this next word, don't make fun of me. I grew up in Tennessee, so that's the way it is, right? But the word used there in Greek is makarios. Makarios was then translated into Latin as the word betas. That was then later translated into English as happy. The problem here is that when we translate it like that, that happiness describes really our current state. It really just describes who you are. It really gives us kind of this idea of blissful or you're fortunate, that you have all things together. I'm not so convinced that that's really what the original writers meant. The New Testament was written in Greek, and that word uh, makarios might have possibly meant it was divine favor given to you on your behalf. Let me say that again. 
that it is divine favor given to you on your behalf. The idea that the words here, the word here was always used to represent the Greek gods or rich people. And usually that when it was around rich people, it was because the gods favored them. It was nothing that they could do on their own, but it was that the gods saw favor on them. And, and that is the word that is used here that Jesus turns this idea of you being rich or fortunate. And he says, that's not why I'm blessing you. That's not how you can be happy. And so he starts it by saying, blessed or happy are the poor in spirit. This leads us to our first point, which is this. True happiness is not experienced apart from Jesus' interaction into your life. Many of us believe that, that we can make it on our own or do things on our own, and we can't. Only through the power of Jesus into our lives can we experience great happiness. Look at what John Calvin says. He says, most people wrongly believe a happy person is one who is free from annoyance, attains all his wishes, and leads a joyful and easy life. You know, this week in, in preparation of, um, preparing for this sermon, I just Googled what makes a person happy. And about three or four articles down, I saw an article from U.S. News. It was written by a social scientist. I don't know if they're a believer or not. My guess is probably not. And in the particular article, they write about what makes people happy. How can they strive to be happy? How can they feel blissful in life? And, and the two points that I wanted to, to point out this morning is, first, it says that in the article, it says that the human, human beings are the only animal in the animal kingdom. That's how they describe it that does not have an active predator and does not regularly hunt for his or her own food. So that alone should make us blissful, should make us satisfied. It, yet, something within the human brain or the psyche always pushes us to be unsatisfied. We're never happy. We're never satisfied. It later says that our unquenched, excuse me, it says our happiness is the goal, that happiness is the goal, and the closer you get to it, the harder it becomes. That there's this idea that there's this goal to attain and we work hard and we work hard, but the closer we get, we realize we're not anywhere close to it. John Calvin later says in that same quote, he says, we are happy in the midst of miseries for our patience is blessed by the Lord and will soon be followed by a happy result. The disciple of Christ must learn the philosophy of placing their happiness beyond the world and above the afflictions of the flesh that happiness is not going to come from our 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 goal to reach things or to accumulate things true happiness will never come from status or power or job or money or other people your, your spouse your kids your friends it won't come from health it can only be found in Jesus because he's the one who created it and then he freely gives it to you Jesus reveals now, he says, in order for you to be happy, there's a particular attitude or posturing in which you must take in order to be happy. And look what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's humility, which leads us to our second point. Humility is possible when we admit that we're not number one. I'm convinced, this is David, I'm convinced that humility is, is maybe one of the most attractive things, attractive traits that a person can possess. There's something about someone who's humble and lives their life as if uh, the world doesn't revolve around them that just draws me to people like that. Life is not about them when good things happen or when bad things happen. They all know that all good things and all good gifts come from God and to be used for Him. Jesus says, blessed are the humble. And then he shows us how to be humble. Look at with, this is a long verse, but look with me at Philippians chapter 2. It's going to be on the screen here. Just follow along and think about Jesus and humility. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among your, which is yours in Christ Jesus 
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That should make you yell and scream. The God who created the world came to the world. The man, the, he made man and becomes one. He created order out of chaos and yet set himself under authority. He created a difficult road and he chose to take it. He depended as a baby on a teenage girl and a carpenter. And he knew the difficult road that he was going to take even to death and death on a cross. And he chose chose to do it freely. Why? Because it was to God's honor. And what was the result? God lifts him up. I think actually one of the a human example of humility is actually our pastor, Jeff. And he's not here, so you know I'm not kissing up. But I really do believe that. I mean, let's think about this for a second. Jeff, we just found out, can juggle. He's also very comfortable in, on a stage. He's likable. He's funny. He's a good communicator. But do you know that he's also an athlete? He loves these triathlon things. I think that's psycho, honestly. But he loves that. He's, he's, he's really, really good at, at sports. He, he really enjoys that. And if that were not enough, he's actually a musician. And he's good at it. And if that were not enough, he's actually a pretty good artist. And a juggler. <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking, when I was in high school, all the girls went after either the athletes or the musicians. And you're telling me you've got a guy who's this musician athlete with an artistic flair. Give me a break, right? (laughs) I think if there's anyone that could have a large head or an inflated sense of self, it might be him, but I've seen him time and time again where he could upstage people, where he could prove that he's the smartest guy in the room, where he could be rude to prove a point, where he could win an argument and chose not to because he loves the church and he loves you and he doesn't think highly of himself and he backs away. That is humility. It was so much so that even when I came here, look, look, confession time, my first six months here, I didn't believe him. (laughs) That I came on staff here and I would just be around him and go, is he real? But that's the truth. And it has drawn me to him. Humility is one of the most attractive toys and what's uh, attractive traits. And what's interesting is that the Greeks saw humility as someone that were, was reserved for low in society. The truth is, is that we kind of live that same way. Look at these quotes that we, we tend to live by. He who has the most toys wins. It's better to burn out than to fade away. It's better to be feared than loved. Or as Michael Scott put it, I want people to fear how much they love me, right? <laughs> we know that those, those quotes are not true, but yet we still live our lives as if they are. And that type of life leads to inner turmoil and depression and brokenness. About three years ago, you saw the video, we launched a ministry here called Marriage Corps. And we were convinced that if we could have a, a ministry that could really dive into the root of the problem in marriage, which is selfishness a lot of times, and sin, that it could transform couples. And we believe that if transformed couples who love Jesus, if that would happen in homes, it would transform homes, they would become better parents, but ultimately they would even become better church members. One of the principles in Marriage Corps is a principle that we call the circle principle. And here's how the circle principle works is that I would take a circle. Now, if you've gone through marriage core, I know you just got cold sweats from me bringing this out, right? Is that 
I could draw a circle on the ground and I can step inside the circle and the only thing that I'm capable of fixing within my relationship and in my marriage is what's inside this circle. That's all I have the power to do. I can't fix my spouse. She can't fix me. Only I have the power to fix what's in here and all the mess that's in here. And it takes this, it, it's really a humbling experience. I've actually seen people will do an exercise similar to this and we'll put it in the floor and go, okay, stand in the circle and, and talk about things that you need to fix. And I've seen people doing this, like, or trying to get out or put a toe in because, because we don't like to admit that we're wrong or that we're broken. And Jesus is saying that's the norm. I think a better way for you guys to understand this principle is for me to introduce a couple who's gone through Marriage Corps uh, in the last couple of years. I'm going to invite Judge and Ann Platt uh, to come to the stage. Judge and Ann uh, went through Marriage Corps two years ago. And uh, you guys have been members here for um, a couple of years, I believe. And I think one of the most humbling points in my life in ministry is about a year and a half ago, I got to baptize Judge and Ann. And it was humbling for me to be a part of that experience, but more so humbling because I realized when we stood in that little hot tub down there, how I was going to baptize this guy, right? (laughs) Uh, So I love this couple. I love what they, I I love how they are very transparent with their life. And you'll know the Platts. Uh, You'll see them around the church. Their sons are always the best dressed kids uh, in in this church building by far. Uh, So, so Judge Nan, tell, tell us a little bit about like what you do or, or how you came to know uh, Park Cities or anything like that? Um, well, I'm a uh, farm kid from Michigan. I uh, grew up there, came down, went to TCU, uh, and grew up here in, in Park Cities. Uh, went to TCU as well. We didn't meet there. <clears throat> I came back, went to SMU for business school and law school. I met Ann my last semester of business school. I thought I was going back north for law school, and she had different plans for that. Uh, so I stayed here. We've been married for almost 12 years. We've got three boys and one on the way in a month. Boy or girl? Boy. Another boy. Of course it is. <laughs> yeah. All prayers are welcome. <laughs> yeah. And we kind of stumbled into this church because of, uh, because of the community outreach that it had. And we ran into some of the community programs. And as we, we, were, we were members of another church, another local church, and as we started seeing what this church was doing, we felt like we wanted to be a part of it. And we kind of dipped our toe in and started coming. I was volunteering at another church, so on the Sundays where I wasn't, uh, we'd come here. And then as we became more and more involved, we uh, decided this was a church yeah. for us. And so you guys went through Marriage Corps. It's a, it's a 24-week course. We know that sounds long. But tell us, maybe describe what marriage was like before. So our marriage, I mean, it wasn't, we weren't having a a really rough patch when we started Marriage Corps, but we had had our ups and downs. Our first year of marriage was actually our worst year of marriage. I think we just got engaged and jumped into marriage. And um, so that was hard. But since then, it was just ups and downs. And, you know, every six months to a year, I would be like, we've got to go see somebody. We need to go see a counselor. And we never really panned out what was what was wrong. Um, and marriage court just kind of fell upon us. Um, Judge can tell you the story that we were not looking for a marriage court class or anything. You want to tell yeah, Actually, we'd come up. There was, we were in service one Sunday, and there was an uh, – you know, in the bulletin was a notification that there was going to be a ministry on Daniel on a Wednesday night. And I thought that sounded interesting. It was a fun story from when I was a kid, and I'd like to come see it more explored in depth. And so we came up here and found out that whoever was delivering it was sick, and they had to cancel the service. And so we just picked another one that was that was in the program, and I had picked a totally, I don't even recall which one, but I would picked a totally different one. And Ann said, no, let's try Marriage Corps. And I thought, uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> we walked down the hall and they were like, welcome to Marriage Corps. This is a 24 to 25 week course. And I was like, what did we just get ourselves into? Uh, but honestly, it was the best thing. Uh, we, you know, there, we got several things out of it. Um, for me, it was the fact that I, 
I was really unhappy and it, I mean, the first few weeks of, of the course really is, is looks at you and what you're doing wrong. And judge definitely, there was a point where the ninth, 10th week, he was like, I, I can't do this. Like we're walking out, we're done. Um, well, and it speaks to, it really speaks to divine intervention because we, we just lucked into this class and, and about nine or 10 weeks in, like Ann said, it's a very, int- it's, it's a very introspective, it's a tough course and it, and you know, it's really easy for me to sit here and tell you everything that Ann does wrong in our marriage. Uh, it's as really, as well as I can point out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the things we found out we were doing wrong is that's what we were doing wrong. And we were definitely pointing the finger at each other. Um, and we're not arguing fairly. And we, it, in, for the first eight or nine weeks, it was evaluating yourself and how bad you are and what you're doing wrong and looking at yourself and scrutinizing yourself. And about the week eight or nine, I don't recall, uh, you know, I looked at Ann, we, we were getting ready on a Wednesday morning and we were fighting. And uh, I said, this, this course is terrible. It's torn us apart. We've, we're worse off than when we started. We're done with this thing. Uh, we'll go tonight and then we're not going again. And we walked in that night and David stood up in front of us and said, at this point, some of y'all might be thinking, this isn't the course for me. Uh, bear with us. It's going to get better. And, uh, and, it, and it absolutely turned on 180. And it did. It's, it's, a, long, it's a long course. Um, but it took that long for us to look at things. Um, for me, it took all of those weeks to look at myself and figure out that I was unhappy with some of the things that I was doing. I mean, for, I, I was looking back all the way to high school on the fact that I grew up in the park cities. Um, and I, you know, always had to be on, I had, I wanted to be a bell and I had to have the right body and I had to hang out with the right friends. And it stemmed to, you know, now where we live and, you know, I think some of that was my unhappiness there. I mean, there were a lot of issues that I had that I had to look at myself. Um, and really the biggest thing was that I needed to turn to the Lord and um, ask him for help. And, and, and then, you know, ask my partner to, you know, listen to me and, um, it's, it's an amazing course. I know it's long, but I cannot say enough about the course. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. And one of the things that I pick up from your story was what you just, how you ended that, which was I, I, I was seeking all of these things to make me happy. And at the end of the day, they didn't bring happiness for you guys. I, I, I'm so proud of you guys and what you're doing. One of the cool things uh, about the Platts is they're going to be leaders. They're going to be a mentor couple for us in Marriage Corps next year. Um, so it's just really fun to see how God has worked in your life. Thank you guys so much for coming and, and doing this. Um, yeah, honestly, shameless plug here. I, I really believe every married couple in this room should go through it. I believe in it that much. I, I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in in over a hundred couples that have walked through this and seen how it has transformed their life if they allow it to happen. We've seen time and time again where maybe a, a one, one person in the, in the relationship will not want to be humbled and will not want to admit, and it, that's when we struggle. If you're willing to work on your marriage, if you're willing to, to maybe take a step of faith into doing that, I encourage you to sign up. Uh, we're going to be starting in the next couple of weeks. A website you can go to, to that's easily remembered is crazygoodmarriages.com, uh, and you can register uh, for our next courses. So humbleness, humbleness illustrates that we're fully dependent on God who provides all that we need. And the truth is, is that I believe that humbleness will find each and every one of us. The truth is, it's going to be whether we invite it into our lives or we're given it. Because we're all going to come to a point where we're going to realize that we're powerless to control the things that happen around us and are in our life. Whether that's death or sickness or financial collapse or injury or job loss or broken relationships. We're all going to experience those things and we're not going to be able to control those. And it's going to be a humbling experience 
And the tr- truth is, is either you can take that and, and invite that into your life to be fully dependent on God, or it's going to be handed to you. Jesus says the good life, the blessed, are the humble, the ones that are totally dependent on God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, which is to our third point. Submission to Jesus and serving others will give you a glimpse of the future kingdom. Look what James says in James chapter 4, verse 6. He's quoting a proverb, and he says this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We started the message off with this whole now and not yet concept. Jesus is saying that you can experience joy and you can experience happiness now. You can experience a blessed life by being the kingdom to those around you when you submit yourself to Him. And then you can fully experience it in a later life. In Christ alone, you can live the good life. So how do you do it? How do you live the good life? How are you blessed? It starts with a relationship with Him. But first, you humbly recognize Jesus is God's Son. That He lives today. That He's pursuing you. And He's wanting to restore a broken relationship with you. It's humbly admitting that you aren't perfect. That you're broken. And that you're the one that's broken the relationship between you and the Father. It's humbly asking Him to forgive you where you've fallen short, where you haven't been able to reach up to to His standard, that you look at His teachings and realize there's no way I can amount to that. And finally, it's humbly asking that He come into your life and He take control, that He becomes Master, that He becomes Lord, and that you live by Him He freely gives it to you and I. So whether you've taken that step of faith in the past or whether it is today could be the day for you, I encourage you to do it once again. Each and every one of us can be reminded of what God has done in our life, how He loves us, how He's pursuing us, and how He wants to restore that relationship with Him. Will you take a step of faith and act in humility and go, God, I need you. I need you to restore that relationship with my life. We can do that today. There's going to be pastors that are going to be in our response room right after this service through those doors over there. We'd love to spend as much time as we need to chat with you and to talk with you about how you can restore that relationship with him and how you can find the good life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for all that you do. I thank you for what you've done in my life. And how you teach me every day that brokenness is normal. And that my brokenness leads to my frustration and utter dependence upon you. And you love me anyway. I thank you for those folks in this room who have made that same decision. I thank you for the Platts, what you're doing in their life and in their family's life. And I pray for that person in this room that is resisting you, that, a, that doesn't want to accept humility. They don't want to come to you. They don't want to admit that something's wrong, but they're unhappy and they've got questions. Father, I pray that you work in their life, that you push them out of their comfort zone and bring them to you. I pray for that seeker that's been wondering what's wrong in their life and why they can't get things quite right that they can now understand that you are their answer. So, Father, thank you again for loving us. May you be honored as we continue to worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.